Oh, hello. Good evening, Rob. Hello. Shaking your head, what? You are live on the telly box. What are you shaking your head for? I am completely lost. Can you hear me? Rob, you are in the show. Oh, there I am. There I am. <laughs> what, a, what a shambles. What an absolute shambles. The first time that we're going to do what this live. With, with absolute, I'm furious anyway at you for having zero preparation. I have to have facials for this. No, stop it. I have to have you know, face, face cream. I have to go through all this stuff with the hair. The hair's into a good 90s mullet now. It's, I have to get everything sorted for this show. And at 7 o'clock tonight, you say to me, oh, we're going to go live tonight. With zero conversation with me, it's it's it's. it's... So, yeah, you just think you're the, king, one, you think you're the king, king around one, here. That's what it is. We do one thing on video without Hatch watching our backs, and it just cocks up straight away because you don't think you're on the video stream. I wasn't. You hadn't added me. It was there. I could see it. Everyone who's commenting now will be able to have said they'll see you yeah. anyway. Okay, anyway, well, people, you Welcome. tell you Good tell evening, I, ladies, I, I couldn't see me. Or I could see me okay very very john cena way to start this anyway despite that shambles anyone that's listening on the podcast is now saying what are you talking about right let's reset hello everybody welcome to the how to be great podcast i'm robert nickel with me uh, is showbiz paul benson and this is what happens when you let him lead you see normally when it's uh, just me doing things uh, there's never there's no there's never a slip there's never a problem i definitely didn't spend hours mm -hmm. editing last week's podcast and still didn't do a great job of it but anyway we are here tonight, and this is a brand new episode, a brand new show, and a brand new little concept, because last week, for the first time, we did this as a, as a video podcast. This week is the first time we are going la, 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 live. So if those of you are listening on the podcast, you are more than welcome. You are our core. I will never forget that, that anyone that's listening <laughs> uh, is where we all, where we started, and you're out for a run, or you're going to work, or you're doing whatever, and you're listening to us. Uh, but we have decided tonight to go live. It's Tuesday night. It's just past eight o'clock. Uh, and I am going to miss Tottenham versus West Ham to do this live on a Tuesday oh, night. I can live sorry, with that. I can live with that. I can live sorry. with that. It's fine. Um, so anyway, tonight's uh, topic uh, is going to be King of the Ring related. Uh, it would be around about this time of year would be King of the Ring. Probably, probably, it probably would have been roughly last week in old money when the King of the Ring used to well, be a, an annual pay-per-view back in the 90s. It was generally mid-June. It's 24 years ago to the day where Austin 316 was born. Is it, is it really? Is it exactly It really, day? really is. 24 years ago to the day. And I figure we probably will mention him in passing, at least, when we're talking about the greatest King of the Rings later. Um, so, yeah, we'll 24 see. years ago. Well, people were furious last week. We, we left off uh, We left off Undertaker Mankind last week when we were doing the uh, Undertaker stuff. But uh, we will see. We did. Anyway, this is how the podcast works. I'm sure there are some That's people joining now. us brand new. And quite frankly, you were deeply unimpressed mm -hmm. uh, with the first uh, three minutes. In fact, I think, um, Paul, you made that Austin reference on exactly three minutes 16, but very strange. Um, <laughs> which I, think, I really think you did. Um, here's how this podcast works, folks. Um, it is me and Paul talking rubbish, as you might expect. But we do have a theme. This is how to be great. What we do is we look at different things about the wrestling business, quite small little nuanced things, and we analyse it down to its very core. Things we've done in the past. We've done who's got the best dropkick of all time we've done who's done the op best opening two seconds of theme music um we'd also um have things such as uh the best ladder match performer of all time all sorts of different things that we've done uh on the podcast what paul and i do is take some of your suggestions you fed back to us some of your ideas we have some of our own uh, and then we uh, come up with a top five then we hand it back to you you guys will do a poll and we will decide which is the number one in our category. So today we're doing quite a straightforward question. Who is the greatest King of the Ring winner? That is our question for this week. And that's what would be the bulk of the podcast. But we need to deal with last week's topic because it was Undertakeover weekend on hookedonwrestling.co.uk and the, the fantastic Amazing. fitting finale for the Undertaker documentary, The Last Ride. Uh, we did an Undertaker topic, did we not, Paul? Uh, it was about the Undertaker's best match outside of WrestleMania. We came up with the top five. You voted for your favourite. 
And I believe Paul is the top five ready for us. He can give us a bit of a rundown on what we selected last week and what has emerged as the winner. I do. And indeed, for once, I had them up and ready without Rob prompting me. So we had we had five, uh, as Rob said, one of which, uh, as is usual, didn't get a single vote. Um, and this time, the one that didn't get a single vote was uh, The Undertaker versus Kurt Angle versus The Rock, triple threat match from Vengeance. So that was rock bottom. That was last, as it were. Um, then we've got the ladder match uh, featuring Jeff Hardy on Raw. Uh, which was just a couple of weeks before that Vengeance match, also in July 2002. Um, that got just over, just over 5% of the vote. Uh, third place, right in the middle, was Kurt Angle at No Way Out 2006. I know that was Rob's favourite. That jumps up to just over 22%. And then in second place, we've got Bret Hart at SummerSlam 1997 with exactly a third of the votes. And then that means our winner in, a, to be honest, a closer contest than I would have expected and I would have bet on was the Hell in a Cell match. Of course it was. Shawn Michaels, bad blood. Really, Rob? There was never any doubt, was there? No, I don't think so. I think that was a, um, a fair win. I wouldn't I wouldn't dispute it. Like I said, it wouldn't be my choice, but it's still a great match. You know, the fact that I would have oh, picked yeah. Undertaker Kurt Angle is more because I like a pure wrestling match where I can. And I'm not sure anyone ever did those better than Kurt Angle, certainly in that sort of era. But the Undertaker Shawn Michaels thing has pretty much everything. Those of you that have been long-term followers of this podcast and other ones I've done will know that I'm not a big fan of uh, when the end is something a bit other than just a clean finish. But in this case, the debut of Kane, so shocking, added to everything. Uh, I really don't think it took away anything from the match. So uh, I cannot uh, disagree with that um, that choice of winner. It's a very fair one. And thank you to everyone for, um, for voting. Absolutely, indeed. Yeah, it was our biggest vote yet so far this week, actually. So that was pretty cool. Um, it's been it's been top guns all over the site. Actually, we are, we, we our quiz, our weekly beat the clock quiz on the site has just become our biggest one ever as well today. So that was quite nice. Excellent. We are growing. We are growing and growing and growing. So also, which is quite apt in lockdown because my waistline and my chin are growing and growing and growing as well, uh, <laughs> as well as your hair. But let's yes. crack on. Oh, you know, we've got we've got all these lovely people. Who's who we've got with us tonight before we start? Um, we so Chris Marden, Matt Barber, Leanne, Chris Hatchimania's here, brother, brother, brother. Uh, we've got Liam, yeah, he's here as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they're the only ones that have commented so far. So guys, oh Ryan is Marnie. Sorry, hello Ryan. So uh, say hello if you're watching, and um, please join Chris Higgins. No. No spoilers, no spoilers. But yeah, Bruce Willis can see dead people. Um, and Darth Vader is, in fact, Open Range's father. Um, but let's crack <laughs> on and um, and see what we've got this week in the King of the Ring subject. This is the point where I, I was just about to say what the uh, the spoiler from the usual suspects, but I forgot the guy's name. So it's, uh, it's a waste of time. Kaiser Soze. Kaiser Soze, that's the one. Kaiser Soze. Uh, anyway, um, yes, so today's topic is who is the greatest King of the Ring winner of all time? Paul's left me on my screen. I'm assuming he's got some sort of connection issue. So I'm going to talk around this uh, while hopefully he returns at some stage. Paul, can you hear me? I finally get to do a solo show without him. Brilliant. I'll try and talk for as long as I can. I probably can talk for about eight or nine hours without anyone with me. So it's not really a problem. It is tonight's... Uh, um, topic. It's who is the best, greatest King of the Ring winner. And the reason is um, because it's around an anniversary of King of the Ring, but it's also, uh, we feel, an apt topic because there's, there's enough to talk about. There's enough through the history of the King of the Ring um, tournament. We're not just going to be talking about the tournament uh, itself. We're not necessarily just going to be talking about the, uh, the pay-per-view element of it as well because there were other uh, King of the Ring tournaments. But this is twofold. We feel that we're going to talk about not just the performance in getting to the King of the Ring, but also what the wrestlers themselves did with it. It might be something, it might have been a bit of a lackluster show, but what a fantastic they job did, fantastic job they did with the character, and indeed vice versa. So before we get into that, oh, I should also say, yeah, for those of you that are live in the room tonight, obviously if you're listening to the podcast, uh, what we do every week is we put something up on social media uh, ahead of time uh, to get some of your opinions. So I do have that with me. And I'll be referring to that uh, as time goes on. But if you are in the chat room, um, I'm not going to look at the chat room today. Paul's going to be doing that and occasionally bringing it up on the uh, sum up on the screen. Um, so feel free to um, to chime in at any point. But bear in mind, 
as we're talking, we'll move on to subjects and stuff. So it may be that we have to nip back. So don't be afraid to, to, to make the same comment once or twice uh, because we will try and get to it. And if we don't read it out, we are at least putting a few up on the screen. Um, before we get into it, Paul, before we start talking some specifics and trying to nail yeah. a top five, um, King of the Ring, as a concept to you, is it something you enjoyed either as a kid or nostalgically looking back? Was it a pay-per-view that you enjoyed? What, what, what's your feelings when someone says to you, King of the Ring? Uh, very nostalgia is definitely one, you know, it started in, well, the pay-per-view started in 93, didn't it? Which was just about as I was starting to really get rolling as a wrestling fan. I've been a fan since 91 on and off, but 93 was when I could really sort of sink my teeth into it on a weekly basis. So it, it's got great memories for me. Objectively looking back, well, sorry, subjectively, it wasn't the best pay-per-view every single year. I think it had its moments and I think... You could tell when WWE were A, interested, and B, had a purpose. I think if the show had a purpose and they had something they wanted to get out of the show, like, you know, someone they wanted to get over, something they wanted to achieve, it was fantastic. Generally, if they were just crowning a king because they had to crown a king that year, you could really tell. Um, and some of the years fall into that category. So mixed bag, but um, overall, I really like it. How about you? I think what's really interesting about the pay-per-view itself is that when you look back, how many times, especially in the early years, I'm talking right at the very start, 93, 94, 95, 96, how often was there a, a King of the Ring tournament, uh, sorry, a King of the Ring pay-per-view that was built around uh, a title match? You know, it feels to me that quite often it was a, it was some sort of tag team, um, you know, one-off match, a grudge match, or it was something mm. involved. Oh, they often found a way of getting Jerry in, didn't they? So you had that pretty pretty yeah. awful Jerry Lawler versus Roddy Piper match, which was really terrible. I think it yeah. was King versus Warrior. Was that on a, on a King of the Ring as well? I was um, going to say the same. I couldn't swear it, but it was around about that time of year, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm fairly, fair, I'm fairly certain that was that. King. I think they used to bring Jerry in to, to work King of the Ring because of his uh, regal connections. Um, so I, I think in terms of the actual pay-per-views themselves, there's certainly not too many certainly in the, the, the earlier era where I think of it as a nostalgia to go back and watch them over and again, there's not all that many. I feel like I've gone back to what I've gone back to watch many more rumbles and WrestleManias and even survivor series and summer slams than I have gone yeah. and watched uh, watch King of the Rings in general, but that doesn't mean I don't have some uh, incredibly fond memories. Um, and it's really interesting looking down the list. I've got a list to me to just to my right here of all the winners uh, of King of the Ring and uh, with only one exception, um, everyone that won it won it just once, so it's not like you had uh, several people winning it lots of times like you've done with the Rumble. No. Um, and pretty much everyone on there has gone to have some level of success or notoriety, but whether or not they were helped by the King of the Ring uh, is another matter. In terms of the history of the tournament, it's worth noting that there were six King of the Ring tournaments that took place off TV. They were just a, a house show thing, really, uh, often in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, but before we get to 1993, which is really the King of the Ring era starting as a pay-per-view. There were several before that. So before we get into this, Paul, are we, are we going to discuss those people? Are we going to include them for, for chat on here? Um, and in, and yeah, go on. Sorry, no, just to answer your question. In my opinion, they should definitely be included because, like we said, half of what we're talking about is what they did with King of the Ring. And some of those guys did some fantastic stuff. We haven't seen any, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen a single match, final, semi-final, quarter-final, qualifier, anything from that pre-pay-per-view era. So obviously we can't judge them on that. So I think it's worth a mention, but I'm not sure that we can we can really put any of them forward with any great justification. Well, I'm going to offer one. What we tend to do on this podcast, we've kind of fallen into this as a little bit of a pattern. Um, but what we tend to do is almost first up, come up with one that's, okay that's pretty good it's a bit of a standard bearer a bit of a, a gatekeeper as it were uh, into the topic that we feel could make the sort of fifth spot not that we really rank the one to five but could you know sneak in as a fifth spot on the list but we think we'll probably find five better that can go above it so yeah because of the fact that we don't we haven't seen the tournament and it wasn't the, the same sort of pattern as everyone else um i would argue of the of the that era there's only one person i would offer up now uh, Don Morocco won the tournament, and um, so did Ted DiBiase, Tito Santana. There was a Bret Hart win before he won on, t on TV. Um, I wouldn't have even told you that DiBiase or Santana were winners. I didn't even know that. No. Harley Race won one of them, and they did do a bit of a King Harley thing. And from there, we started to get a little bit of a, if you beat someone 
you might take the kingship off of them. So you had King Haku, King um, Haksor, you know, things like that. But I'm saying the only one of the pre-pay-per-view era that I would like to perhaps offer up for inclusion is Randy Savage, because winning King of the Ring directly or indirectly led, led to the Macho King gimmick. And he played that to the hilt. You know, he played that right yeah. up, bringing, being brought in on the sedan chairs, you know, having sensational Queen Sherry, you know, the Macho King was a thing for much longer than just the year uh, in which I think it was Macho King basically up until he turned back babyface, wasn't it? And then he became Macho Man again. But, it was, yeah. Um, he was he was still Macho King when he came out at WrestleMania Seven, so that was literally the end of it when he retired. So, so when was it? When was his win? It was nineteen eighty seven. So that's three years. Yeah, so three years worth of uh, of the Macho King. Um, so, what do you think? Is, is he is he worthy of penciling in 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 place number five at the moment and then we can maybe go over that as uh, as the time goes I, on to see if we can find five better ones i would say yes i would say yes i think he was so good as the king of the ring that he would get he would be in consideration just based on what we've seen you know never mind you know he might have been absolute garbage in the tournament let's face it it's randy savage he wasn't we could say that with comfortable <laughs> certainty that he uh, that it was all right um, but he did such good work with it that I think we, um, I think we include him, or at least put him on that, you know, put him on that list. You know what I mean? Here's one for everyone in the chat room, right? Don't go and Google it. Don't go and look it up. Let's see how your uh, your knowledge is. Since we're used to doing the quizzes here on the uh, the Hooked on Wrestling YouTube and Facebook pages, who did Randy Savage beat in the King of the Ring final? Oh, I want to see. Who, I want to see who comes up with it first on the chat. Mate, I'm just looking. Who... I'm I'm just looking at that list. You know, after I said. We're sure his uh, King of the Ring journey would have been pretty good. <laughs> Having just looked at the bracket, I'm not so sure. <laughs> well, perhaps I haven't got the bracket, but I do have the, the winners and the runners up to the side of me. So, uh, let, is it, let you me, tell me let if me anyone. Tell you. you tell me when anyone first, gets it in the chat room. First round win, Nikolai okay. Volkov. All right. Yeah. Classic. Right. I love okay. Nikolai. Deal of Nikolai. Okay. Second round. Second round win. Jim Brunzel. Okay, yeah, lovely. Jumping Jim. The semi-finals. Dangerous Danny Davis. Okay, right, okay. Is, um... And then the final, as you point out, I'll give the game away. It was Chris Marlins had a guess at Duggan. He's our quiz king. He's wrong. Um, it is, in fact, King Kong Bundy. The king so, Nikolai Volkov, Ni Nikolai Volkov, Jim Brunzel, Dangerous Danny Davis and King Kong Bundy. If Savage got a watchable tournament run out of those guys, then he deserves <laughs> to win this thing. Let's leave it there. End of podcast. Yeah, okay. Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Perhaps not. And actually, it turns out he was uh, the runner-up the following year, losing to uh, Ted DiBiase, and those two would wrestle in the uh, in a final at another stage in a tournament, wouldn't they? Anyway, um, let's move on then to... Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. But let's not go through it chronologically, because we could get a bit bogged sure. down in some of the early years and and not pay due deference to uh, anyone later on, um, such as we end up doing a, a wee bit for the uh, the WrestleMania uh, show that we did a few weeks ago. Yeah, so sure, I'm going sure. to th I'm going to throw it to you, Paul. When I say to you, King of the Ring, about three weeks ago we did Mister in Your House, didn't we? Who is the person you most associate with in your house? So if I say to you, King of the Ring, almost as a blind test, who is the first person that comes to your mind? This is not necessarily the person that's going to be best for this poll, but if I say King of the Ring, you think of who? Uh, funnily enough, Owen Hart. Okay. Owen Hart is, you know, to me, he's he's a pretty seminal King of the Ring. Really, sort of, you know, I guess one of my favourites of the of the pay per view era. Actually, um, I almost didn't want to start with him because he he truly is one of my top choices, and we tend yeah, to sort of build up to that, really, don't we? But I think it's fair to, you know, it was one of the early tournaments. Um, he, God, God, did he make the most out of that gimmick or what? Oh my goodness! If we're talking about what a King of the Ring win did for someone, Owen Hart has to be right up in that conversation based on what based on what he did with the gimmick. The King of Hearts stuff kind of wore away after a little while, but it was awesome. It was so so cool. It was either you can't see my screen or you're doing a great job of no selling because I was just introducing everyone to my uh, my Owen <laughs> guy. There's my Owen <laughs> I did, with the crown. I did miss that. Yeah, can you see the crown there? It's got it does I it does can... say it does say macho on it. It is my macho king figures crown, which I've put on Owen for today. And I couldn't find 
I've got an anvil with the same sort of uh, trousers from when they did were doing the uh, the, with new the new Express. foundation stuff. Uh, the new, new foundation. foundation. Thing, but in, and I and I, I can't find my anvil, which is annoying me. Um, but I want to include anvil in the in the chat because the thing is with Owen's win, there's a couple of good matches in the Owen one. They're a bit shorter than you might want, but good little matches for what they were. Yeah. But it's a great story. That pay per view tells a really good story about Neidhart coming back, being on Brett's side. Um, interfering in Brett's match with Diesel, which I don't think was a tournament match, was it? I think that was a, that was a title match. Title versus but title. An Anvil ve ve basically saves Brett, and so you think he's on Brett's side, and then he appears later on with Owen. It turns out he was making Brett, making sure Brett didn't lose the title, so Owen could wrestle. Just a really, really lovely, nuanced piece of storytelling, and then it brought in An Anvil as a really, you know. Owen was pretty sleazy, but bringing in Anvil as his number two as well worked, worked beautifully. And that took yeah. us into the summer, didn't it? Into SummerSlam, the cage and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, it so, did. You know, this was, this was not just Owen's pay-per-view, but this was Owen's year. And actually, it was Brett and Owen's year because all the way from the start, um, the back end of Survivor Series with, with Owen turning on him when he kicked his leg out of his leg. Oh, that was, that was Rumble, yeah. wasn't it? The Rumble, Rumble. where he kicked his leg yeah. out of his leg. Um, and then, uh, obviously, Brett winning the Rumble and then Brett and Owen at WrestleMania, then the King of the Ring with Owen, and then yeah. SummerSlam match. So the whole year, and even actually Survivor Series, because Survivor Owen was Series as well, well with, yeah. with, with Backlund. So it is Owen's year, 1994, without a shadow of a doubt. I think when I think of 1994, in some ways he's the MVP of the whole year. And you're, you're talking Bret Hart's around on, on top. You know, Diesel emerges at the end of the year. You know, Sean and Razor at WrestleMania, but it's Owen's year, 1994. It really is. Yeah. Oh, I don't think there's any. There's any real doubt about that? I think Brett's the only guy that could could contend that. Um, and really, it was they they were there because they were there together. You know, Brett without Owen and Owen without Brett just wouldn't have been the same. That Owen Hart character was great, but he was great because of the fact that he had his straight laced, accomplished brother to be both jealous of and to try and usurp and to get bitter, more bitter and more bitter as the year went on because he couldn't. Only to culminate in that Survivor Series language. Again, you know, you look at King of the Ring and how good that booking was and how it took us out of, you know, we didn't really see that coming at all. I remember that Survivor Series match. I bought, all right, I was only 12, but I completely <laughs> bought hook, line and sinker that Owen Hart, you know, this, this, this cross face chicken wing was so vicious that even Brett's hated rival brother was starting to feel sympathy for him. And he wanted his mother. I totally, I was there, man. I was there. And then when he wheeled away from the ring, arms aloft as he did with his towel in one hand, like draped over his arm as he ran triumphantly back to the uh, back to the <laughs> dressing room, I can still see it. As you can tell, it was phenomenal. Um, and that all came on the back of his, you know, well, it didn't all come in the back of the King of the Ring win, but the King of the Ring win was pivotal in uh, in keeping that momentum going because it was every time. But basically, Owen could do anything apart from beat Brett when it mattered. He could beat Brett when the pressure wasn't on. He could win the King of the Ring. He, um, you know, he later won obviously the IC titles and the tag team titles. What he could never do is beat his brother when when it counted. Um, and, the, and, and neither well, and well, he, he beat his brother at WrestleMania, of course. But as you as you point out, when it counted, when it was for the actual belt. Mm. And one of the best things about the the, the the pest heel. I always think Owen was a pest heel. And um, I would compare that Owen Brett story to something I wrote about for the website a couple of weeks ago, which was the um, Chris Jericho versus Shawn Michaels feud of 2008, um, yeah. in which every time that Shawn seemed to have dealt with this, you know, smug prick Jericho, Jericho got something back on him again. You know, so Michaels thought he'd beat him in the match. Jericho punches his wife. You know, Sean is going to retire and whatever. The Jericho does something else. Sean beats him in a match. Jericho wins the title in the scramble later that night. There was always something Jericho was doing to piss off Sean that much more. And it's the same with the Owen story. He he hurt Brett, then he beat him, then he won King of the Ring. You know, and Brett had to put him in his place. And, you know, it took a long time. And, and you know, it's a great story. It really, the more you analyse it, the more you realise it's a great story. Yeah. What I'll say about yeah. Owen is that I think Owen is one of the best one of the best character heels, not character heel like a, an overblown gimmick, but playing the character of the heel um, believably without being a very good, I never thought Owen was a very good promo. You know, I, I might be feeling a bit harsh there, but I never, I've never seen a great Owen Hart promo. 
I don't think he um, talked to people in the building. I think he was a bit no. mumbly. I don't think he, I don't think he was good on interviews. But his physical body language, making you hate him, you know, in the ring, at the side of the ring, if he was second in someone, on the tag rope, if he was there, every little thing he did was masterful. I just don't think he was a great promo. But then Brett wasn't a great promo until 1997. No. So, you know, a Brett had a pretty good damn career. Other than, you know, so I think, uh, you, you've got to give him a pass. I think Owen absolutely goes straight into the top five. I cannot believe we'll find too many people to to go past. No, because no, no, no. we're talking a good tournament with a great story. But what he did past that, calling himself, he literally sat there in the chair and said, "I am no longer the Rocket. I am now the King of Hearts. You'll call me the King of Hearts." He invented his own, well, whether it was written or not for him, but he invented his own moniker nickname right there and then. Um, and it carried on through the, you know, through a lot of his career. It tapered off, as you said. But that before that point, your only reason for hating Owen Hart was because he was jealous of his brother. After that, he grew that little bit more arrogance, and that parlayed into, um, you know, the the two slammies thing, and that parlayed into the captain of the team with um, Bulldog. There was always something Owen had to brag about. They they gave him things to brag about, even if he'd won the King of the Ring by deception and he won the Slammies by just picking them up. You know, he believed he'd won them and we hated him for having lied about it. Absolutely by the textbook heel booking. And for me, King of, King of the Ring feels almost like it could be a, a heel thing. A little bit like Money in the Bank oh, yeah. should be a heel thing. Most of our... And Royal Rumble heels. should be a face thing. Yeah, kind of. It does feel that way, doesn't it? Obviously you can't do that yeah, every yeah. year, but it feels to me that certainly Money in the Bank should be a heel thing because it should be a a cowardly thing to do, to cash in on Absolutely. someone. Absolutely. Or the Absolutely. baby faces should do what Rob Van Dam did, which is to say, I'll challenge you at a certain point. Anyway, we digress. I think, I think um, the, um, I think the, the, the most, um, the most sort of all encompassing way of saying it is probably that the best King of the Rings are heels and the best Royal Rumble winners are faces. But there are yeah, exceptions. Possibly. Mm. Always anyway. exceptions. We're, we're certainly not, uh, but the, the King, I think, more to the point is that we're, we're going to, like I said, we'll talk about this in a, in a split fashion about the pay-per-view itself, the, the tournament itself and what they did with the gimmick. And I suppose the people that carried the King gimmick forward were heels, weren't they? You know, to, you know we'll, yes. we'll talk about some in, in due course, course but, yeah. you know, so without naming names right now, you can think of the people that car carried on wearing the crown or a scepter or, you know, had the, the, the ermine jacket or even just the nickname, you know, there were people that uh, that, that carried that forward. Um, and in fact, let's yep. do one of those next um, while we're okay. talking about this. Let, I, I'm going to throw up King Booker. Oh, Just by even wow. saying the words. You know, I don't necessarily say King Triple H, King Billy Gunn, even King Bret Hart, even King Owen Hart. Obviously, it's King of Kings. But you do say King Booker. And I will say this. Yep. And I'll look down the lens and say it because I know people don't always agree with me. I am not um, particularly a big a Booker T fan. I didn't probably watch enough WCW when he was, you know, really, really flying. But I felt when he came into WWE, I felt his character was a bit two dimensional. I never really cared for, you know, he's a good wrestler, but not a great one. Um, King Booker was awesome, says uh, John Reyes on the, uh, uh, on the on the comment there. Um, so I'm not a big Booker T guy. I, I can't stand his commentary. It drives me nuts. But I did love King Booker. King Booker is the one part of his career where I thought, yeah, that's a character. And I've, I've said before, there's two types of heel. There's the, there's the, there's the silly heel or the, 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 the pest heel, and there's the monster heel. That's the two types. And this was a pest. But oh, man yeah. alive, it was, an, it was an entertaining pest. And there is a, a phrase in wrestling, or at least on the outskirts of wrestling, which is not just the name of an AEW or a pre-AEW pay-per-view, but to go all in. You know, there are so many characters that you feel sometimes he doesn't really feel this character. He's playing the part he's been given. But Booker T, whether that was his idea or it was given to him, he was all in. He was, and it should never have worked, right? And if he'd have not given it 100%, it wouldn't have worked. Uh, but he, he, he just he embodied that silly, ridiculous heel get up you remember the english accent and the scepter he carried around for a seemingly forever well the um, terrible english accent but that was even funnier than he yeah, was that a terrible was the part, that was that was exactly the charm but 
you've really brought out the big guns here, mate, because um, to me, uh, well, there's no point beating around the bush. He's the best in my eyes. I think he's the best king of the ring. I couldn't tell you his tournament journey. Uh, did right, he beat that was, Lashley that was in the final? He did beat Lashley in the final, but I only know that because it's on my screen. I know right. diddly squat about that tournament. And that was going to be the thing I was going to say, is that I want to push put this across to everybody. When you're voting, which you will tell you how to vote you know, towards the end of the podcast, but when you're voting, I want you to consider everything. I want you to factor in, factor in the tournament win and, mm. and what came after. Because I could not tell you a single thing about the tournament I don't even think it was a pay per view, was it? I think it was on it, SmackDown. It was no, it was it was on pay per view. The final was on pay per view. Oh, the final was on pay per view, um, right. and that's that's the thing. Like, I think it's slightly unfair on the guys that came after the pay per view era, um, and and the same thing before, really. But the the really once you got to that point, the end product was what happened afterwards. The tournament was kind of there just to facilitate them getting to that position. Um, so I think it's it's less fair to judge them on the same criteria, although we kind of have to. Um, it's like imagine like um, like let me X Factor, right? Think of it like X Factor, right? Remember the early Can years I, of X Factor when do everyone. You mean, do you mean? X no, Park, I mean the TV show. I mean TV show. No, I, I mean the best. The best. I was I was going to start singing Uncle Cracker and everything. Please don't. Uh, please don't ever don't ever sing Uncle Cracker. We'll violate YouTube terms and conditions. Um, everything I've ever wanted. I've got a mute button, you know. I'll never get that right. back. And, and um, I am hovering over it now. I um, imagine it's like X Factor, right? People make the mistake of thinking X Factor is there to create a, a, a singing superstar. It's not. It's to create an entertaining TV show. TV show. And if it just so happens to create a superstar... Um, afterwards, like a Leona Lewis or One Direction, who never won, by the way, but the same same thing, or JLS, bonus. But it's not there for that purpose. And I think in a pay per view era, I think that was the same with the King of the Ring. It was there to sell a pay per view. And if the King of the Ring went on to be successful afterwards, happy days. But it wasn't the driving factor. After the mm. pay per view era, it was to create a character, to create a superstar. So the onus was different, you know. I can remember one tournament post pay per view. I can remember the tournament that William Regal won, and even that's a bit sketchy. Um, but I don't think I don't think I necessarily hold that against him. I remember the final. I remember the coronation. And I remember the best King of the Ring, in my opinion, of all time. So yeah, he goes in there with an absolute golden bullet for me. It's funny you mentioned about sorry as a, as a tangent, but we are allowed tangents on this pay per view. Uh, on this paper, oh, on this podcast. Um, it happens quite a lot. When you say a lot of people that didn't win X Factor actually did better than the people that won, didn't they? Yeah, and of course, other similar similar shows because I don't I don't think Su Susan Boyle didn't win. Britain's Got Talent, did she? Uh, no, um, she was she second. Didn't. I can't remember who did, but no, she did. Was it um, Diversity that won that? Yeah. I think it was it was something like that. There's been like, a, a lots of the people that didn't actually win have ended up doing the thing. What I was going to say to bring it back to wrestling is how many of the people that have won tough enoughs and diva searches and so forth have ended up falling flat, and actually the people that didn't win yeah. it have ended up doing okay. It's funny how that sort of thing works, but we'll do that as a topic one day. We'll do um, reality shows in wrestling and how that's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. how that's affected. Yeah. We'll pencil that in. Um, one final word on King Booker. Um, it just feels like it, the guy had a storied career, and like I say, my ever so slight um and that's not a dislike i'm just not i'm just not as such a so such enamored as, as some people are about him but i think it's the best part of his career and i think when someone had such a good career and such a successful one for you know a good i mean we're talking booker t winning king of the ring in 2006 well when were Har harlem heat were you know pr a pretty oh. featured thing on tv in what 94 95 <laughs> uh yes yeah, certainly 95 probably a so bit you know in fact, so they were they were um, they were part of the team, part of the heel team when the Shockmaster debuted, weren't they? So that was ninety three. Okay, um, there you are. They were they were one of the uh, one of the opposition. It was, it was I think it was them, Sid Vicious and Ric Flair. Someone might correct me on that, but no, it wasn't Ric Flair because he hosted the no, thing. No, because anyway, it was Flair, it was, Flair for gold, wasn't it? So, yeah, but um, whatever, well, doesn't matter. But they so yeah, Vader. I think it might have been, been around thirty years. Right, okay. it might have been Vader, but. 
Um, yeah, I mean that's thirteen years. You know, after after Harlem Heat, and King Booker is fourteen years ago. Yeah, you know, and he's still over. You know, he might not be a very good commentator, but he's still he's a likable guy. Um, I've never actually met um, Booker T, but almost everyone I've ever known um, met him says he's a lovely fella. So, um, do you know what? Yeah. I don't remember meeting him either. Even when he was in TNA, did he ever come over for the tours? I've got no recollection of spending yeah, any time he definitely, with him whatsoever. Yeah, he definitely came to the first one. He came to the first one because I will tell you what they did. He wrestled Rhino, uh, or he rather didn't wrestle Rhino. He was he was the op- opponent for Rhino um, at the Liverpool Olympia in the first TNA tour in two thousand and eight, and they had a right. 12, 14 minute match, and I think they did about three moves. Nice, it was, but nice. it was quality. All they did was crowd stuff. I bet it was, yeah. Rooney's and and just so fun, so good, brilliant house show stuff, fodder. Um, yeah, and he'd have been around a few times when I would. I'm, I was backstage, for example, at um, um, Balfour Glory two thousand and nine. I think he teamed with um, Steiner in a multi tag team match that the British Invasion were in. So I've, I've been around him a couple of times. I just never actually uh, spoke to him or indeed interviewed him. Um, but this isn't yep. about my interviews. It's about the kingship. Um, shall I bring up someone that I have done then? Let's, someone that I've interviewed several times and someone that you've met more times than me. What about King Kurt Angle? What about that? King Kurt Angle. King Kurt Angle, right. Now, I don't know about best tournament, but there will not be a better, fi- a better field, right? Get this, right? But this 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 tournament was the only one, as far as I'm aware, that went five rounds. They started with 32 guys in the tournament. I'm not going to list all 32, but the quarterfinals that were on pay per view, right? Get this. There's a few there's a few names that aren't quite up to the standard. But bear in mind, this is the year 2000. Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, Crash Holly, Bull Buchanan. So there you go. There's the Duffers. Rikishi, Chris Benoit, Val Venus, and Eddie Guerrero. How good? When you think that. King of the Ring should be a mid-card to upper mid-card tournament. You know, it's not for the main event, is it? Um, in summer 2000, imagine where all those guys were at. There has never been a better King of the Ring field than that. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's pretty good Amazing. indeed. Um, I, Amazing. Won't say never, I won't say never because I haven't seen every every single lineup. But I mean, it would be hard uh, to match that in terms of name value, quality of wrestler, etc. Um, I can remember a bit more of this. I remember Kurt winning. Um, he beat Rikishi in the final. Um, yeah. I remember it a little bit better than I do King Booker's one. Um, but again, Kurt sort I wouldn't say he didn't need it. But there was certainly a thing. But by that point, if you take away Brett, who kind of established the King of the Ring, everyone mm. from the next five or six, you're talking... Just tossed Arlene, it away, didn't they? No, I'm not saying tossed it away. I'm saying, but they need. I'm saying Owen, Mabel, Austin, oh, I see. Helmsley, Shamrock, Billy Gunn. They weren't there. They no. hadn't made it. Kurt was. Kurt was kind of already made by this point. This is June 2000. Yes. He'd not been around, yes long, no. but he'd made himself. He was already in that top bracket, or at least very, very, very close to. And, it. and that's the, King the of point. The he was very close. I'm not saying it didn't help, but I'm saying that Kurt was at a better point, even being in, in there less than a year. He was at a higher point than any of these previous winners of the pay-per-view era, excluding Bret Hart. It was a really important building block. So obviously, like you say, he came in in 99. and um, Excuse me if I got my timelines muddled, but quite quickly he won the... No, sorry. So he came in in 99. He had his unbeaten streak until he faced Taz at the Royal Rumble. Post-Royal Rumble... He went on to win the Euro European title and the Intercontinental well, title both of them, prior to lost WrestleMania. So he lost yeah. him at Mania. The point is, he's building and building and building his accolades to be the most accomplished rookie in Federation history. The King of the Ring was a big part of that because, like you said, it moved him up to that next level because then that moved him up to the Triple H stratosphere. Because Triple, right Triple after H King H of the Ring, yeah. Stephanie McMahon took interest in him. He started the Triple H feud. He got the main event at SummerSlam. He got the title match. And then that went on to him actually winning the title. Um, who did he beat for the title, by the way? Who did, that was the Rock. Who it was the Rock, wasn't it? Wasn't it the Rock when Rikishi interfered? I did it for you. I did it for the Rock. Isn't that all that? Isn't that Kurt? Is that right? I, I honestly, honestly can't remember. Um, I think it is. I think I think Kurt, I think Kurt beat the Rock because Rikishi interfered. I'm and, sure you're right. And, and I'm missed sure you're right. missed Kurt and hit the Rock. I'm sure that's that era. Okay. Okay. Um, 
but the point is it built into that position so i think i would i see where you're coming from but i would look at it in a slightly different way and i would say it was pivotally had to win the king of the ring that year because if he hadn't it would have taken away that momentum and that idea that this guy is winning everything in year one and it okay. was the final block that took him to that it was like it was you know it's the video game it's the last level before you get to the big boss at the end for those yeah. who play Street Fighter 2, and I know you're not a big fan, Rob, I know you're not, but he's Sagat. That King of the Ring win was Sagat. You beat, oh no, even better, Mortal Kombat. He was Goro. He was Goro. You beat Goro, and then you go and face Shang Tsung in the final. And Shang Tsung is definitely Triple H. Um, I'm just trying to keep relevant, mate. I'm just trying to keep relevant, just pretending, you know, down with the kids. You're trying to that. keep relevant. Uh, you're trying to keep relevant with video games that are out in 1995. Mortal Kombat. I've got Mortal Kombat under my TV. I bought it a couple of weeks ago. It was Mortal Kombat 7, which also has Robocop in it, by the way, which is quite cool. I'm the joke. But anyway. Robocop from, Ro um, from Capital Combat 1991. Yeah, Sting's or whatever, Tag Team Partner. Sting's Tag yeah. Team Partner, yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, so that's my opinion. You know me. I'm totally biased against Kurt Angle. I think he's wonderful. I think he's the greatest pro wrestler that's ever lived, not named Randy Savage. Um and I think he was a great king. I don't think he used it for that long. And I think he kind of had that persona. You know, we talk about the goofy King Booker persona and whatever else anyway. He kind of was there anyway. So I think it kind of just added to it for a bit. And then he moved on to other things and it didn't last. But he was kind of, for me, it was it was the one that pushed him up to the next level. And the, the examples of you know, him and Brock Lesnar, in similar ways, although very different characters, use it as the last obstacle before world title matches on the way up quickly. I um, I like your point about um, it feeling right for him to win and you know, carrying on his progression because I've long been a big believer. Is I like big names winning big matches. Mm. Um, and I mean that in other sport as well. I'm a big golf fan. But if I'm watching a major golf tournament, I like seeing Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, you know, Jordan Spieth, um, you know, Brooks Kepka. I like the top guys winning, not every time, but it makes them all feel prestigious. You've had a couple of years of the golf and you go, I can, you know, who, who won them that year? Him, him and him, who are Yeah, they? right. And you forget yeah. them and it feels less prestigious. Now, I'm not saying every single match should always be won by John Cena and Roman Reigns, but the fact that Rum Royal Rumbles used to be always won by a great star and then you have a little run of Rumbles where you go, well, did it work for Sheamus? Did it work for Del Rio? Do you know what I mean? There's, there's, a, there's a little run of rumbles where you go, hmm. I like them being won by big stars. And I, and I think that Kurt Angle felt like the right winner at the right time, as you, as you rightly say there. I remember being an 11-year-old, an Rob, and being convinced that King Sean was the right thing to do. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm still not sure it wasn't. But, you know, when they went King Mabel, In I still feel... right, okay. You could well have gone King Sean then. Obviously, they were doing something a bit different with him. You know, mm -hmm. taking him down the babyface route. He would wrestle Razor in a, a ladder match at, at SummerSlam when King Mabel was wrestling Diesel. But it felt to me like King Shawn Michaels was the... Because he hadn't won the title by this point. He was the most over, over babyface in the company, but hadn't won the title. Had he won King of the Ring and been King Shawn, he might have been the babyface that had fit best with the King of the Ring gimmick. You know, I think he might be the, the, the one that never won it that should have won it. You know, I, I, it's hard to see a reason for... If they wanted to do Mabel versus Diesel, they could have just done it anyway. You know, the, the big guy threatening Diesel's title. Did he, did he need to win the, the, the King of the Ring? Anyway, we'll come back to, uh, to Mabel uh, in due course because I want to move on from Kurt Angle on to the following year because I want to say mm -hmm. possibly the best King of the Ring final. Edge versus Kurt Angle. Um, great match. Great, feud, great feud of that era as well. I would say the best King of the Ring pay per view uh, by a mar by a well by a massive massive huge margin. Actually, it was a phenomenal pay per view. What else was on that show? Um, I, watched, I, I, I watched the scrambled. Uh, well, listen to it scrambled on Sky pay per view. So what else was on that pay per view? All right. So you got the Shane McMahon versus Kurt Angle street fight. Oh right, okay, yeah, cool. The the um the two plates through the gla plate glass, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then you got the triple threat match uh, between the, the sadistic hit comedy heel Austin, Chris Benoit, and Chris Jericho. The, that combined with three good tournament matches in a tournament that I want to come back to because it has got a really interesting story. Um, that combined with a really interesting tournament that was just the semi-finals onwards. There, to me, it is just perfect. It's a great pay-per-view. 
it is a good pay per view, and um, I think there's a there's a topic to be discussed. I don't know how how we can get it into a how to be great topic necessarily, but it's a topic I like discussing, which is the people that made the people. I.e., would, um, for example, Triple H have got to where he got to without mankind, without Mick Foley in some mm-hmm. way twice. You know the trip, the Tonterhurst Helmsley mankind feud, but also the Triple H Cactus Jack stuff. You know, was was Mick Foley the one that helped Triple H the most? Was Triple H the one that helped Batista the most? Was Bret Hart the one that helped Steve Austin the most? These people would probably have got to where they would have got to anyway, but they needed an extra leg up. They needed someone to make them more credible. Even going back to you know Hogan helping Savage. You know, there's there's lots of people that yeah. needed someone to get somewhere. I would say that the person that did the most for Edge was Kurt Angle. You know, I think losing that yeah. final, but also around that era. When was the head shaving? Is that around about then as well? Um, no, it's later. It's like um, 2002. Okay, well, that's yeah, Edge, 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 but Edge is 2001. Oh, so, so, it's sorry, it's only, so. all right. Yeah, it's only a bit later. It's only a bit later. And even in, even in 2000, do you remember they called themselves Team Eck? It was Edge, Christian and Kurt. Well, yeah, they, I remember that very well. In fact, this, this the semifinals of this tournament are Team Wreck. Team that was rep. a thing. Yeah, Edge, Christian, Kurt, and Rhino. That was a oh, thing right, on Rhino, TV right, for a while. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, it was It was a thing. And they had four heels in the semifinals, all a loose, um, you know, one stable, effectively. Um, which was amazing. Sorry, I am. I don't want to railroad your point because I do want to come back to it, but carry on where, where you were going with that. No, I think I was essentially, I was essentially, I was just, I, but I think part of the the make the whole thing of king of the ring is to make someone and like you say it's it's the it's the progression it's the storytelling of it's the next step on your your road to glory as it were and we'll certainly yeah. talk about that with the, the following year as well if we want to you know carry on um with with Brock Lesnar um but edge edge to me could have edge could have slipped through the net edge could have been any you know well okay you compare him to christian because I'm not sure Edge is a far, far better wrestler or talker or anything than Christian. I think they're on a pretty much a par. But Edge has had a better career. And it might just have been in the right place at the right time and impressing the right people at the right time and having the right people to work with, whatever the situation may be. But there will be others. I'm, none of them are coming to mind right now. But there's other people that have had a decent mid-card career, a very credible career, but just haven't had the right moments with the right people. Maybe Edge has. Listen, I love Adam Copeland. I'm not slagging him for a second. I think he's terrific. Um, but I'm saying that I think he's been a bit fortunate at times. I think he could easily have had a mid-card career and been happy with it. In the end, he's turned out to be a yeah. bit of a megastar. Well, let, look, let me give you my take because it kind of feeds into that well. So let me, my take on this tournament, the tournament itself is absolutely spot on. Obviously, it's the, it's the, I think it's the first... No, it's not the first time. It's the first time in a couple of years, sorry, that we've only got the semi-finals. Um, and the finals. I know 99 and 2000 had the, the, the eight man field on. You start with Edge and, uh, so you start with Kurt Angle and Christian. Really good little match to open up the pay per view. Shane McMahon, who's facing Kurt Angle in the uh, street fight later on in the card, comes out and helps Kurt win. So it's like, oh, okay, it's a nice little wrinkle. I think as an educated audience, you understand that what he's trying to do is Have an to extra match. keep. Get him an extra match. Exactly. But it's a really nice little wrinkle. Then you've got Edge against Rhino, which wasn't quite as good, but still a very functional good match between two skill workers. You go on to the uh, you go on to the final, and then you've got Edge against Angle. Shane McMahon comes out again, but obviously it doesn't matter whether Angle wins this one or not, does it? Because there's no extra match for him to go to. So he screws Kurt into this one and adds a bit more fuel for that excellent street fight later on. So then you've got Edge as the winner. Like I say, he'd beaten four, you know, three other heels in the in the tournament. But the key thing is what this did for Edge was slightly different than Kurt and for it, it broke it 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 rubber stamped him as the single star. Okay. So to me, you compare it to Bret Hart winning the Intercontinental title at SummerSlam 91. That's the same effect. Um, and it, it broke him up from it didn't break him up officially, but it, it told the audience and it told his wrestling fans that yep, this is the guy. This is he's no longer Edge, Edge the partner of Christian. He's Edge, future single star. And obviously, it was the very next night that the seeds of dissension first started to be sown, which very quickly led to the breakup and the Christian heel turn. Whereas Edge was a face, effectively, I think, if not the very next night, but but not long not long after. Um, 
and it worked so well. So I think, again, although Edge didn't make a great big thing about being the king, it was a really good platform to accomplish that next level career goal. It's, it, it ended the Edge and Christian era effectively, or was the beginning of the end. And it was a real strong exclamation point on that. So it's, it's an important one. Would I have him on the five? Possibly not. But it was awesome. I've only got one issue with everything you just said. Do you know what it is? Go on. Exclamation point. Just because you're wearing a bloody <laughs> New York Rangers shirt. Again, Denver by the Broncos, way. Denver, Denver Broncos. 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 Oh, sorry, I thought it was the same yeah. one as last I thought it was the same one as last week. He's going to show John me. Elway. Can't see, can't John see that. Elway. Don't care. Don't, not interested. Um, I thought it was the same one as last week. Oh, okay, it's a different It's a different generic American sports shirt then. Um, <laughs> You're, just, you're supposed to be editing a website, man, saying things like, or co-editing, sorry, Liam, um, you know, overseeing a website um, and you say exclamation point. I'm absolutely <laughs> furious. Um, anyway, uh, I think we're fairly content, are we not, that Owen and Booker and Kurt would be very, very welcome inside the top five so far. We're saying the edge, we've got fo- fond memories of the edge uh, win. It made sense. It helped springboard him. We love the pay-per-view. But is it is he tied in enough with the King of the Ring to be featuring in this? I don't think if you when I start thinking of King of the Ring winners, you probably have to tell me Edge won it, and I go, oh yeah, Edge won it. Do you know yeah. what I mean by that? I immediately say, yeah, I do. Six or seven other people before I go, oh yeah, Edge won it. Yeah, I I totally agree with that one, mate. Yep, yeah, I would. Let's well, let's let's say our five for now: are Savage, Angle, Owen, Booker, and Edge. Well, um, the only five we mentioned, well, but yeah. Exa- ex- well, yeah, but they're all worthy. <laughs> we, we haven't come up with, we haven't got one that we don't like yet. But um, we, we suspect that Edge, at least, will will take the plunge at some point. Let's stay in that era, because we've just mm. done 2000 and we've done 2001. Let's move on to the next one, because it was the, the last for a few years. Um, Brock Lesnar. Um, yep. He fits into essentially the same topic as uh, Kurt Angle. The new guy, the meteoric rise... He's kind of got to win everything he's in. Mm. It just made total sense, didn't it? The Brock Lesnar, you know, shuffle yeah, was on its way. Yeah, yeah, it was. And obviously it was different to Angle. He'd been in there a lot less time. You know, he didn't debut till the night after WrestleMania. So he'd, and he'd not been in the singles ranks. Uh, sorry, the um, he'd not been in the mix for the singles titles. Clearly his trajectory was world title from, from day one. So really, right, it, was, it, it was the same effect, but a very different way of doing things. He came into that King of the Ring and he smashed through the field. Uh, he beat RVD in the final, didn't he? Um, mm-hmm. Who did he beat in the semi-finals? Was it? It was RVD beat Test. Um, Brock Lesnar beat. I'm just looking up. Oh no, sorry. Brock Lesnar beat Test, and RVD beat Jericho. Um, so he just beat beat the hell out of the field, and it was a dominant performance for a dominant character, and it got him to where he needed to be. And I think that was the only one where the official stipulation was the King of the Ring got the title match at SummerSlam. So it directly led to that. Do you know what, right? I'm surprised that that didn't happen more. Because mm, absolutely, for those, of, for those of you that are younger listeners, viewers, not just to us, but to WWE, um, that don't realise that the Royal Rumble only started being a gateway to the WrestleMania main event in 1993. Um, there had mm-hmm. been several Royal Rumbles before that. I think from 88, I think, was the first one. So the first four or five Rumbles, you just won the Rumble. It was something you did. Um, yeah. And then from 92 was when it was vac- the, the title was vacant, so Flair won it. And then 1993, they decided you'd get the title shot at WrestleMania, and then it's gone on from there. I can remember once again getting my uh, my little guys out here. My play again. I'm talk- for the podcast listeners. I'm talking about my wrestling figures when I refer to my little guys. Um, I'm saying that I used to use these and have my own little tournaments and stuff. And my king yeah. of the ring always, my king of the ring always got my got a title match. Well, there you that go. I was kind of my, in my head. The, I think it's because I was thinking of Owen won the king of the ring and wrestled for the title at SummerSlam. Uh, Mabel. Mabel won the King of the Ring, wrestled for the title at SummerSlam. I think in my head, Kurt, two of the, two of the first, did. but I'm going, I'm not sure I was still one of the wrestling figures when I was 16. I might have been, <laughs> um, but, but certainly in early, early, early days, then, I, you know, to me, my establishing 
uh, era of King of the Rings, uh, you know, the, the, they seem to get a title shot. So I, I'm surprised it didn't happen as an automatic thing a lot more often. Um, but yeah, is that, so is that right? That Brock is the only one that officially, that's what they did. That was the only one. So I'm looking at it now. There was what? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten King of the Ring pay per views. Four of those King of the Rings went on to face the uh, champion at SummerSlam in the main event. But the only one, yeah, where that was a stipulation going into the tournament was 2002. Okay. Um, so, so it was so effectively because that was the last pay per view, wasn't it? So, effectively, Brock Lesnar wasn't fighting for a crown; he was fighting for a title shot. So. To him, it was like you could, you know, you could imagine, right? If you, if, if Brock, if Brock Lesnar is a real character, which, if anyone is, he is. <laughs> he um, is, yeah. You, you can imagine Brock Lesnar going backstage with that crown, tossing it into the nearest bin without even looking twice at it, jumping in his car, cashing in his check, SummerSlam, and that's it. He wouldn't have given being King of the Ring a second thought. Um, so, to me, he's a great performance and a key part of his early career journey but not even in the conversation for this i totally agree um it might be the one with the best and most logical booking of all of them yeah um, yeah yeah but in terms of mem being memorable and fitting the gimmick and all that kind of thing this may well just as well have been a number one contenders tournament that took place in june you know yeah, it didn't yeah, have to be absolutely. and the final or it could have been taken place a month earlier the final could have been at backlash yeah, you know, it, it didn't. It didn't really matter that it was a. King. It's not the King of the Ring like what we know it, um, and it may well have been. You know, maybe that was part of the reason to to shelve the gimmick because you know that's two thousand and two. It's eighteen years ago, yeah. and we've had five King of the Rings since then. And it's been two thousand six, two thousand and eight, two thousand and ten, two thousand fifteen, and two thousand and nineteen. You know, so it's very, been very here and there since then, and there's obviously mm. been reasons for doing all of those, which will we'll get to. So I think Brock kind of rounds off that sort of, uh, that era and brings us to an end. But yeah, I don't think we can really um, uh, see him as a contender. Um, right. Let's go all the way back to the start then. Yeah. Your favourite, I think. Let's, let's do, uh, let, let's do Brett. There he is. Look, I've got, I've got hello, hello I've got, Brett. I've got two that Bretts. Was... I've got one. I've got the pink and the black and I've got the black and the pink. I've got two Brett Hearts. I do um, believe that but... Brett Hart you just held up was the one that was released in 93, was it not? I don't know. I've, my dad, I'm not that good with my figures. I just I know I've kept them, but uh, he's got how many? Oh, he's, got, he's got so cool. He's got four hearts. So cool. He's got four hearts on. That's for his kids, isn't it? So when did he have four kids? That's the uh, the way to work it out. But uh, Bret Hart, 1993. I would say undoubtedly the best performance of a King yep. of the Ring. So all the way through, obviously we didn't see the ones that were before the pay per view era, but all of the, all of the people that carried the crown brilliantly, that had the character off pat whatever the best performance in the single evening um, possibly ever you know forget just the king of the ring brett's three matches that night against a baby face kurt hennig against bam bam Bigelow, and against razor ramon i'm not sure it's in that order but um razor first. It's, razor first it's just sublime absolutely sublime was it razor it was razor first Razor first in that garb, I think, as well. Uh, and, and, and then, then the, the Bama there. Get, oh, amazing, amazing. I'm trying to be, I'm um, trying to be, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be visual, and I don't have a, I, I don't see. have a Kurt any. Oh well. So yeah, it, you know, there's no, there's no discussion on this. There's certain opinions in wrestling that are just that opinions are there to be debated, and then there are opinions that might as well be facts. And the opinion that Bret Hart, the single best one you know tournament run of any king of the ring in history is an opinion as a fact um three incredible incredible matches you know what you can do in such a short space of time because those matches went what 10 15 and eight minutes respectively or something like that so not I'm not, large, I'm, you, I'm not you sure don't, and you don't need long matches to have great matches so you, you know you had the Brett Razor match, which was you know a big heel against against a technical babyface. You had the face versus face technical close catches catch can brilliant with a little bit of animosity building throughout the match, superb. And then you had the big monster, fresh baddie against the worn down good guy fighting from underneath, who'd already been in two grueling matches and had the shit kicked out of him by two of his old former opponents. Oh my god, like. 
just amazing. There's, there's like no one has come even remotely close. And the key thing about him, there were three such, there was such different performances as well, three completely different matches. There was nothing the same about about any of those matches. The people that say Bret Hart was a Formula Eight worker, and they do, and they're wrong. Just look at King of the Ring '93. That's Bret Hart in one night. And then you get the end of the and then the end of the match, and you know what is going to hurt him when we talk about it, but not enough to knock him out of the five. I don't think is the fact that by the end of that pay per view, he wasn't King Brett anymore. Um, <laughs> you know because Jerry Lawler had walloped him and taken him out, but that was part of an angle that lasted for two and a half years. You know, an ongoing Defensive. angle that defined the middle of the nineteen nineties for Brett. Brought an, effectively brought a new um, upper mid card main event heel into WWE, and just fed everything that came beyond. It was just it was pivotal. Like although Brett never ever referred to himself as King Brett after that, the legacy of that tournament win in the immediate aftermath was massive um, for for Brett, for Lawler, for the mid nineties scene in WWE. You know, effectively, you even birthed the Owen angle because if it was originally meant to be Jerry Lawler against Bret Hart, the Survivor Series, obviously that didn't happen for, for reasons we people can look up if they don't know. Um, and um, and it went from there. So, mate, great, great performance, phenomenal legacy as king, effectively, or you know, as a result of being king, that has to be there, just has to be there. I'll move on to, to, to Lawler in just a second, but to address your points about the, um, you know, people that do say that Brett's formulaic and stuff, it's like, they really they really don't get it, do they? Well, in that in that case, you know, no. only fools and horses is formulaic then for saying lovely jubbly and, you know, calling Rodders a plonker every episode. You, know, you get your shit in, but you still create the greatest sitcom of all time. Um, Brett Hart might be, if you look at everyone that got over, when I'm talking about getting over, I mean properly, Top of the shop, beloved Drew Drew Money over. Everyone else that's ever been at that level did it for various reasons. But for for Hogan, it was the the muscles and the tell me something, brother. For um for Warrior, it was the tassels and the running to the ring. For Austin, it was the beer swilling and the character and the middle fingers. For the Rock, it was the catchphrases. For Michaels, it was the flamboyance. For Cena, it's the whole package of the rap and the good guy thing. Everyone has, all, has had all these things. For Flair, the limousine riding, jet flying. For Bret Hart, it's because he was a wrestler. Yeah. Bret Hart is the only person, and I mean this, the only person in history to get to that level, you can't see him on the screen, that level by being a good wrestler. He is the only one. I defy you to give me another one. You give me another great wrestler, but there'll be another reason why they got... I'm not saying Shawn Michaels is not a great wrestler, by the way. Of course he is. But the reason Shawn Michaels got to the top was his personality. The reason yes. Undertaker got there because of his character, flair, personality. Brett, wrestler. And, and he's the most credible, believable, logical, in-ring performer that has ever lived, as far as I'm concerned. And if you, if you look at half of the roster today and ask them who their biggest influence is, they say Bret Hart. And it might be the revival who are as old school as you get. But Roman, Rain Roman Reigns has grown up in an unbelievable wrestling family with Rikishi and Yokozuna and the Wild Samoans and The Rock and whatever. You ask Roman Reigns who his biggest influence is, he says Bret Hart. And it's, it is, he has defined a generation. And that night will be a night that people looked at and went, he's my guy. I want to do that. Yeah. I want to make people feel like he makes people feel. And... Like I'm clearly biased. If anyone that knows me knows that I think Brett's the greatest ever, but I think it's his it's his shining light. I think it is one of his greatest ever nights. And it's not winning a title and it's not wrestling his brother and it's not main event in WrestleMania and all those other things. But if you if you wanted if you were asking me to show you the greatest ever moments of Bret Hart, I think I might show you King of the Ring nineteen ninety three, where I think he's just absolutely in his pomp. He was the best thing in the company at that time. And there was no one else that could have won that. First. It was the first tournament, effectively. There had been yeah. ones before that. But it was the first one. We are introducing you, pay-per-view audience, to a new, uh, new category, a new formula. He was the only choice to win that. He's the only person that could have given it that sort of credibility. And to go on to what you said about Lawler, you're spot on about that. But what you, what you neglect to mention, and it's a fair 
thing to omit because it's easy to forget. We're all familiar with Jerry now. We've all known Jerry for anyone, anyone that's our age has grown up with Lawler. Anyone that studies the history books knows about Lawler in Memphis and in the AWA and all this kind of thing. Um, by the time that Jerry Lawler attacked Bret Hart at the end of the King of the Ring 1993, Jerry had been in the company, what, eight months? Seven, uh, eight months? Uh, yeah, Jerry yeah, joined yeah. in late 1992. Right at the end of 1992. Lawler's first real match anyone saw him do was the, was the Rumble in 93. Yep. And even in 93, he comes to the ring in the Rumble and, and Bobby Heenan goes, oh, it's the host of superstars not the king of memphis no nope. he was the host of superstars he was the co along with vince no one knew lawler as a wrestler in wwf clearly in the in the industry he was one of the greats but in the company no one really knew him he was brought in as this brash heel comedy character and actually by attacking brett they made lawler into something as well so it made all sorts of things that tournament i absolutely agree with you i think going forward there's no king brett you know, had Brett not won that tournament, he'd still be the biggest thing in the company in the summer of 1993. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it still wouldn't have necessarily have, have affected things. But, you know, I mean, I mean, if, the, if we don't put it, if we don't put this in the top five just for the performance alone, then we're not doing our job. Yeah, he's a, it was a catalyst. He's there, so I think he, he edges out. He edges out edge. Um, I also think we've got, you know, we want to run this another 30 minutes or so, I guess. And we've got probably three or four names we need to talk about properly, don't we? Um, remaining. Well, I, think, I, I, think there's a, I think there's two more contenders. In Go my, on, let's have the contenders speak, then. Speaking personally, I've got two more that I think could break into this list. And Go I'll on, give me one most, of yours then. Give me well, one I'll of yours. Give the, I'll give the most controversial one till last, in my opinion. Right. I'm going to go to 2008. And I'm going to offer yep, you. Okay. Will, I'm going to offer you William Regal, mm -hmm. who I think absolutely deserves to be part of this discussion because um, sometimes it's they talk. They say, don't they, that sometimes the man makes the belt and sometimes the belt makes the man. Well, King of the Ring had gone out with Brock Lesnar, and then had its own thing four years later with Booker T. And although yep. that was a great gimmick, and we've praised that to the hilt, we love Booker T. It was a comedy act. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, he was a good wrestler and he was a top card, but he was a, King Booker was a comedy act primarily. It's a very good one and it's a very good heel act, but it was still more for laughs than it was seriousness. The 2008 William Regal, William Regal was probably the funniest man in WWE history, by the way, but 2008 William Regal, I think he was the GM, wasn't he, when he won the King of the Ring? He put it all together. If, if, if he Ooh, wasn't, it was around maybe, that sort maybe. of time. They went fully behind Regal for a very short amount of time. His GM ship, I think it was, the, it was the second time round. It wasn't the Commissioner Regal of, you know, um, no, peeing no, in no. the teapot with Tajiri and, and Jericho, but a second time round, it was, and it was, it was a superbly played. Do you remember him doing the, the lights out gimmick as well, turning yeah. the lights out on everybody, bossing the show? He was absolutely in his pomp. He had that. He had the King of the Ring, and then he failed the test. And well, the only yes, person that the only person that is to blame. For William Regal running aground is William Regal, and he knows that, and he's admitted that. So it's hardly a, you know, I'm not throwing shade or anything like that. He knows full well that it was his problem, and, and he was in a, in a bad place right then. Had he not been, had he been a sober, clean William Regal at that time, that could have been the best thing that ever happened to him. He could have been a main eventer for a year or two. Oh. That character was that good, and obviously he's always been that good in the ring. But he's always had the pompous Englishman, which is a fucking mid-card gimmick, by the way. You know, it works and he's great and he'll be happy with his career. But he was a career mid-carder. Vicious, evil, horrible, nasty villain, regal, king. Different game. Brilliant. Amazing. Different and to this game. day, I believe his Twitter handle is Real King Regal. I think. Is that? Oh, yeah, it is. I'm it sure is, yeah. he's Real King Regal. It worked. I mean, I think that's probably when he, it's probably not far away from when he signed up for Twitter. So that's probably why. And he's just not changed it. But I still think he sees that as being his moment and it didn't quite come off for reasons that were out, well, not out of his control, but in his control and, you know, out of other people's. But were, for the short time sports. it happened, I loved that gimmick and I loved that tournament. Oh, unquestionably. And, there, you know, there were all sorts of rumors flying around at the time that that was his passage to the main event, like you say, potentially the passage to a world title run. Didn't happen. 
it was a great King of the Ring winner because remember it, the final was against CM Punk. Yeah, but let's let's take the whole tournament. He beat Hornswoggle in the first round because he put himself up against Hornswoggle. Put himself against him. Yeah. Um, yeah, Finley in the his old running buddy Finley in the in the semi final. Um, that match has been done on numerous occasions, hasn't it? Most most famously on Nitro when they beat the living hell out of each other. Um, and then the final uh, against CM Punk, that everyone kind of assumed was going to win. He was the favourite. He was the one that everyone wanted. And he got beat by William Regal, the vicious English bastard. Um, and he got way over, mate. He was way over. And it was a really good win. But then he cocked it. Yeah. And and for that reason, he, to me, he doesn't, he doesn't make the list because of that. It, it, it fell apart. <sighs> I, I, I think I reluctantly agree with you. I think coming into this podcast... I was like, so and so's getting in there, so and so's getting in there, Regal's getting in there. Because if you say to me, King of the Ring, I think mm. of Regal ahead of most of the people that we've spoken about. Perhaps it's because I'm a big Regal fan, because perhaps it's because I'm English, whatever it may be. But I think of him really, really high up this list. But the more we've spoken about it tonight, we've talked about a few people and I've gone, well, actually, perhaps what was going on with Kurt Angle and perhaps what was going on with a couple of others. I, I do sort of respect that maybe there's going to be some. I think he'd probably be on my five, but I feel yeah. that when we come down to it in a minute and we talk about it, I feel that I'm probably going to end up having to figuratively tap to you. And uh, I mean, this is a democracy, folks, between Paul and I. We actually have fallen out surprisingly little in this podcast so far. <laughs> I was quite looking forward to shouting at him and telling him what an idiot he is, and actually, he's he's annoyingly reasonable. Um, but yeah, I feel it might be one that I have to, I have to concede a little bit. But I do want it noted that it was such a good piece of work at the time. Yeah, and it's it's kind of sometimes we knock WWE, WWE creative. Um, I've done that twice now, and I don't like doing that. Um, yeah, the air, air quotes. But um, sometimes we knock the creative department, and we knock the people that are booking. Um, perhaps a bit blithely and not really realising what we're doing. It's just a, a catch-all term for something not working. Yeah. This is a time where whoever was writing and booking got it so right and the performer let them down. And again, I say that with all the love in the world for Regal, who I have met and interviewed several times. He's always been an absolute gent, one of the most fascinating people to listen to. I'm not sure of his exact role down at the Performance Centre other than being um, you know, the figurehead on TV of NXT. But if he's if he's around that performance center on a daily basis, those people learning the trade have got no one that they could learn um, more to uh, no. uh, more from. I've just seen Chris's point about the air quotes. Yeah, fair point. I had to go at Paul for saying exclamation point. He's having to go at my air quotes. No, it's fair news. Um, but in terms of Regal, I, I think I, I I sort of accept it. One final point on that, actually, just just thinking about it, is that um, you said about. Oh, no, sorry, we talked earlier on about people making people. So it might be Mankind for Triple H or Brett yep. for um, Steve or for Edge for Angle, Angle for Edge. Um, William Regal made CM Punk in a lot yep. of ways. All of CM Punk's first, I'm not, I mean, Punk was a great star in the Indies for years, so I'm not saying he wasn't already a great wrestler. But in WWE, William Regal got Punk ready. He was the one that had the first credible matches with CM Punk. To a degree, yeah, 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 to a degree. He... Um... He sort of did, didn't he? He sort of he didn't get to the top level, but he no, got but incredible he to a WWE audience. He moved him forward. Um, speaking of which, you know, on this podcast, you know, people who listen to this podcast often will know that sometimes I chuck a chuck one in just to put the cat among the pigeons, just to put one in there that yeah, you know, just to be a dick, basically, just to create some discussion. But there's one in that I want to put like in you. now. <laughs> well, no funny that. Um, I want to put one in now that. Sounds like I'm doing that, but I'm actually deadly serious. Okay. Um, it's the most recent King of the Ring, King Corbin. Okay. Okay. Look on. Right. So essentially, he's in the bracket where the tournament itself was, eh, it was okay. It lasted on TV for a few weeks. It wasn't as bad as some of the post pay per view ones, but it was fairly mundane. Good fun. I, I liked how Shorty G or Chad Gable or whatever you want to call him, was Chad, Chad Gable at the time, had the run to the final. He didn't think it was going to happen at all. It was all a bit, you know, the, the, the tournament itself was very unexpected. But when Corbin won, Corbin, Baron Corbin is 
a shitty heel. And when I say shitty heel, I don't mean a bad heel or a bad wrestler. I mean, he's a shit. His character is a shit. And he winds you up because he's a shit. He winds his opponents up. He winds us as an audience up. People rage on, on Baron Corbin because we don't like him. He's doing his job, guys. Like, he is a heel. You know, it takes an incredible incredible balance to be a heel like that nowadays, okay? Because, you know, for, for what, the last 20 years, we've cheered the heel. If the heel gets too good at doing what he's doing, we cheer him. We, you know, we, we anoint him a face. We less, lessen their impact as a heel. Conversely, if they're not good enough, if they're too, you know, boring or whatever, we just forget about them. We don't talk about them. We're not interested. Baron Corbin hits that sweet spot where he pisses you off and you don't like him. And he's a heel to everyone. And I think the King of the Ring was perfect for that. It was a similar win to Owen Hart. And I'm not comparing Baron Corbin and Owen Hart as talents and as wrestlers, but it was a similar setup. And now he's embraced that King gimmick, hasn't he? he yeah, him more than anyone for, well, since King Booker has embraced that King King gimmick. And I think it's been the making of him. I think it's ratcheted. You know, it's not necessarily done anything for his place on the card. He's He's pretty much the same as before he won that tournament. But, oh, my God, it's turned the smugness up a level. And it makes makes people beating him mean that much more because he's he's that much more pompous. So I'm I'm putting a case forward for, for, for King Corbin. Uh, I would I would I would agree with a lot of things you said about his character. I actually think and I don't want to sound like I'm having a dig at everyone here, folks, but uh, wrestling fans, Baron Corbin is the heel that you deserve. Um, because quite frankly, if you go to a pantomime and you know your role in the audience, you cheer for Peter Pan and you boo Captain Hook. Right. And if you think Kevin Owens is a great heel and if you think that Daniel Bryan is a great heel at the time and you think whoever is a great heel, boo them. Right. Boo them. It's what they want. It's their job. You are not helping by cheering them. Now, there is a difference. Sometimes someone will do something and you just like what they do. And like a good for example is Becky Lynch wasn't much of a heel. She didn't do all that much heelish. No when she turned on Charlotte, because Charlotte was pretty annoying, and the WWE just misread what the, the, the feel of the room was. Totally. And everyone went, hooray, she's turned on her. And they went, oh, shit, that's not what we meant. And they went, well, well, we mean what we mean. We love Becky Lynch. And then they pivoted and they went to where they needed to go. Bad example, cheer Becky Lynch because you did the right thing. Becky Lynch wasn't, you know, a heel. But certain people, like Owens is the one, always one, the one that comes to me, is that, do you not look at Kevin Owens when he's been a heel and gone, God, I hate that prick. Isn't he just an horrible, nasty, mealy-mouthed asshole? I want to boo him. I want to hate him. I respect the hell out of him. I think he's one of the greatest wrestlers on earth. But when he was a heel, I want to boo him. I wanted to boo Jericho when he was the suited, honest man. And I wanted to boo Edge when he was with La Familia and he was protecting everything. And you did. You booed them because they were so... You wanted to boo Bully Ray when he was yes. um, standing in There's TNA saying, do you know who I am? You went... God, I hate this guy. You hated JBL with his big car and his hat and his smug ways. You hated them, right? And there's not necessarily been loads of those, but what started to happen is he's a cool guy from the Indies. I'll cheer him anyway. And it's like, don't do it. And for, okay, for all of you that have been, oh, I'm going to be extra cool and I'm going to cheer him. Well, well done, because now you've got Baron Corbin and you don't like him and you <laughs> think you don't like him because he's not very good. But actually, you don't like him because he's really, really, really good at what he does. And you've worked yourself into a little bit of a little cul-de-sac and you don't know where you're going. Sorry to rant at most of you. I'm the, uh, Paul's, Paul's well happy as the, the head honcho of Hooked on Wrestling. Thinking, Thanks, Rob. Have a, go audience, our target, have a go at our target audience. Yeah. But generally Sorry. speaking, I just it winds me up. Don't you know, I'm not saying you have to be follow the establishment. Boo who we say. Cheer who we say. No, you're allowed your own voice. If someone, someone's doing something crap, then you can let them know. But when they're doing something really well, please do them what they what you, you think they, they would want you to do because it just helps everybody. And anyway, long story short, I think Corbin has accidentally fallen into that job. But the old school 
of Vince and Patterson and Pritchard and whoever else is, and Heyman and whoever else is in positions of power, old school thinking is still, if they get booed, they're doing well. So you may think you're booing them because he's terrible, but you're actually helping the guy. So by cheering yeah. the people that you love and booing the people that you don't like, you're actually doing the, well, the opposite to what you think you're doing in the first place. Um, in terms of the King of the Ring, I could probably say that I've not watched enough of wrestling over the last year or two in the King Corbin era to make a fair assessment. What I will say is I think everyone felt like they do now about Baron Corbin pre-September last year. And I don't think mm. having King of the Ring or not having King of the Ring, I think all it did was give another little, it was a pit stop for him. It helped him go another 20 laps. It's yeah, the same I know what you mean. But it just gave him a little bit of a boost. Oh, that's going to help you get round the track a few more times rather than petering out. It gave him a fresh reason to be cocky because it was Baron Corbin, the lone wolf. And then it was Baron Corbin, the kind of suited um, or not. So, but the, the, the shirt and tailored trousers Shirted, yeah. executive guy. And now it's the king. It, it just, it's the same gimmick really. It's just, it's just recycled and repackaged. It's a, um, it's a fair point. And heels like I, that need it, don't they? They need that little, like Owen earlier we were talking about, they need that little, that little fill up. So I think you're right. I don't think I'd want him in the five, but I did. I just wanted to to put to, to put his name out there and 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 appreciate him. I guess. I think he's I think nearer to the five than some of the other people. What I what I'll do next is run through basically everybody that we've missed before going cool. into the one person I want to talk at length. And I think Corbin is going to be ahead of pretty much everyone I'm about to mention, um, with possibly one exception. But uh, to rattle to rattle through, I'll give all the names first of all. And then I'll hand to you, Paul, if you want to bring anyone up to discuss in, in slightly more length. But the people we haven't talked about, King Mabel, uh, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, 97, Ken Shamrock, 1998. I never remember that Ken Shamrock won King of the Ring. No, Billy Gunn, pointless. 1999. Uh, Seamus, 2010. And Bad News Barrett, 2015, I believe, are the only ones that we've uh, missed off other than the, uh, the pre-1993 uh, non-televised Kings. Um, so is there any one of those that you want to analyse in a little bit more detail? Perhaps there's one that you want to say you've got a contender for the five? No, 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 not really. I think of those, if we were to pick one of those, I'd either go with, I think object, Bad News Barrett did okay with that for a while. Um, it was very low key and it didn't last very long, but he did fine. He did, he did what he needed to do. And I actually, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get so much ridicule for this. I didn't dislike King Mabel for a while, you know. I didn't hate it. It was very, it was very sort of Corbin esque, but with everything, I thought he was okay. He was a terrible wrestler, and he do you not think it was a two month? Quickly. Do you not think it was a two month gimmick? Yeah, totally. It was but basically I, but it was King enjoyed. Mabel to just to lead to a SummerSlam match. Yes, I know he carried on being King Mabel, but it was it was literally a means to an end was, to get to the SummerSlam main event, which totally, was terrible. It was to build a monster heel for Diesel, and although it was a shit main event, it did what they tried to do. It was not a good. Thing. But I, I enjoyed it for those two months. I thought it was okay. So I don't think it was a waste of the um, of the tournament winner that year necessarily. But um, we're talking best of the worst now, aren't we? We're not. We're not. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's nobody's pulling up any trees on this. But I did. Here's the thing I, about. I, I don't think it was much as some. Here's the thing about 1995 King Mabel. We've just done Undertaker huh. weekend. Undertaker over 30 years of the greatest character of all time, the retirement, hashtag thank you, Taker. We did the podcast last week. Everything's been Undertaker, black and purple for all this time. How that character has been protected, how few people uh, beat him, tapped him out, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Mabel beat him in the King of the Ring tournament because Karma kicked him in the shoulder. <laughs> Everything that they have done to protect the Undertaker, and he lost that match because Karma kicked him, in, not oh. Karma bit him in the ass. Karma kicked Kama Mustafa kicked him in the shoulder. Like, if there's certain things you oh, want to, do you, do you remember when Del Rio came back after that um, break and beat Cena like that? You know, you just think yes, they really should. Yeah. They re they really wish they hadn't done that. Now, there's certain things that go. I think they probably should have had Undertaker lose in a slightly more screwy way than getting kicked in the shoulder by Karma. Although it's only like the, um, yeah. that's his Undertaker's mate, isn't it? Charles Wright and Undertaker are really tight. So Taker probably wouldn't have done that for most people. 
I think Mabel was a part of that crew as well. Could be mistaken on that, but no, you, um, might be right. you might be right. But certainly, but certainly, you're right. Karma was one of his one of his better friends. But yeah, let's not dwell on it anymore because we've got one more big name we need to discuss. Yeah, we have. Um, I just want to quickly mention uh, Barrett because I think I think Wade Barrett is one of the great missed opportunities ever. Um, I loved Barrett in the Nexus. Mm. Uh, and I remember when Bad News Barrett started and it got panned left, right and centre. Everyone going, this is terrible. A month later, people going, oh, I bloody love Bad News Barrett. That, talk about people jumping the gun. Do you know what the most recent um, example of that is? Tell me the most recent example of people jumping the gun and getting it wrong, Paul. You tell me, mate. Nothing to mine, I'm afraid. I forget exactly when it happened, but there was one that it might even have been the night after WrestleMania last year. I'm not sure. You tell me the timeline better. But I remember watching a Raw and this little figure, puppet figure of a buzzard came up ah, yes. and looked around and disappeared and whatever. And everyone went, what is this stupid, non, you know, PG era, stupid piece of crap? I've read online it's going to be for Bray Wyatt. They're going to give him a bloody hand puppet. This is ridiculous. Blah, 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 blah. A couple of months later, that was Mercy the Buzzard and the Fiend was around and the Firefly Funhouse. And it turned out all right, didn't it? So, I'm not a big Fiend guy in terms of his booking, but that whole Funhouse, Funhouse stuff, that got over. And it does go to show every now and again we don't. And by the way, Madison Square Garden, the most knowledgeable fans on earth, Booed Rock, booed, um, booed Shawn Michaels against Sid. They know nothing. Anyway, oh. moving, <laughs> moving swiftly on, we do have one name to talk about. Uh, it is 1996, as Paul pointed out to me earlier on. It is 24 years to the day in which a certain Stone Cold Steve Austin was crowned as King of the Ring and he stood next to Doc Hendricks on a little plinth and he uttered a few words that may have just been a throwaway promo that he came up with that afternoon. Um, but it changed the uh, the landscape of professional wrestling. It created, it begat the most successful shirt of all time. Speaking of successful shirts, I'll tell you what I read over the last couple of days is that they reckon that WWE have made more money selling NWO shirts than they paid to get the NWO to come to the company. How about that for a good bit of business? Yeah. But I'm talking yeah, about the well, shirts quite. that said on them. I'm talking about the ones that had a three and then a colon and then a one and a six and uh, some letters above it. And uh, they did okay. They did all right with that. They did all right. The things yeah. he said, the things he went on to do. My question to you, Paul Benson, is, is he important enough to King of the Ring? If he'd have simply beaten someone else that night in a non-King of the Ring match, if he'd have done it the following month, at another pay-per-view, would Stone Cold Steve Austin have still got over anyway? Did he need King of the Ring, or did he just need a live microphone? It's a really good question. Um, he needed the Jake Roberts match because the 316 was a direct result of him facing Correct. Jake Roberts. But he could have done that on Raw. He could have, I'm going to go, by the way, I'm going to go back and forth on this opinion. I haven't got a definitive answer. He could have just faced Jake on Raw and then had a post-match interview and said the same thing. But then would it have meant as much because he wasn't on a podium at the, you know, the closing stages of a pay-per-view having just won, you know, the biggest tournament of the year? Hard to say. But then the key thing to me, and we have discussed this many times off air, actually, is that was not the making of Steve Austin. It made the T-shirt ultimately, but... He did. He went back to losing and losing to Yokozuna and not being on pay per views. Right. Okay. Directly yeah, right, after right. the King of the Ring. So, what was the next pay per view? Tell me what the next pay per view um, after the King of the Ring was. In '96. Well, it would have been in your house, won't it? It was, it was in your house. International incident. It was yep. main evented by Bulldog Owen and Vader against yep. Ahmed, Sid, and Sean. Sean. Who did Stone, Who did Stone Cold wrestle on that pay per view? Um, Savio Vega Mark Mero Right On the third match out of five In ten minutes He beat Mark Mero Yep Who did Stone Cold wrestle at SummerSlam? That was Yokozuna in the pre-show, in the, in the pre wasn't it? Pre-show match 
ring ring breaks. Do you remember? Two minute yeah, match, yeah. Ring, um, turnbuckle broke. Next up, in your house, ten mind games. Who does Stone Cold Steve Austin wrestle that night? Obviously, it's the famous it. Shawn Michaels versus Mankind uh, main event. Who did Stone Cold Steve Austin wrestle that night? Henry Godwin. Uh, you're correct. You're correct the first time around when you said I can't tell you. Oh, Savio. I can't answer that. No, no, no. You were correct when you said I couldn't answer because he didn't wrestle anybody. On a packed <laughs> pay-per-view in uh, extravaganza that included matches such as Savio Vega beats Justin Bradshaw with Uncle Zebra Kaya. On such a pay-per-view in which you had a 56-second pay-per-view match in which Jose Lothario beat Jim Cornette. On such a pay-per-view where Mark Henry made his pay-per-view debut beating Jerry Lawler. That is a show that Stone Cold Steve Austin was not booked on. Next pay-per-view, In Your House 11, Buried Alive. Who does Stone Cold Steve Austin wrestle here? Nobody. He's in the opener... Beating Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Right, okay. And now now we're starting to get somewhere, but Helmsley okay. is not really a top That's star. Then, is it? This is 1996. So he's wrestling as an okay Hunter Hearst Helmsley. What's the next pay-per-view? That's Survivor Series, isn't it? And who's he wrestle there? Well, that's Brat Hart. And now we're out. Now we're off to town, right? <laughs> but Correct. that is November the 17th. November the 17th, five months yep. after he won King of the Ring. I put to you, Paul Benson, and everybody that King of the Ring 96 did nothing for Stone Cold Steve Austin. Nothing. He stood on a platform and he spoke to Doc Hendricks. That could have happened at any time. The company that they were dealing with him, the company that would ultimately use him to make more money than they'd made in the history of the company before or since waited five months until he was in a match of any note whatsoever. At that point, Brett made him and Steve made himself. I put you that the King of the Ring did bugger all for Stone Cold Steve Austin. Jake Roberts did something for Stone Cold Steve Austin and the T-shirt manufacturers did something for Stone Cold Steve Austin, not King of the Ring. He's not on my five. Well, look, what made Steve Austin ultimately was being handpicked by Brett Hart to be his return opponent. And, and be part of his story ongoing from there. That made the whole damn thing. The question you've got to ask yourself is, would Bret Hart have picked Steve Austin had he not won King of the Ring? The answer is yes. Almost certainly. You know, we don't know the timelines on those, but by the time King of the Ring had come along, um, Bret, Bret was on hiatus. Mm -hmm. If you believe the common story, Triple H, on Earth Helms, who was meant to, ring the King of the, King, went to win the King of the Ring that year, I am guessing, and I'm sort of filling in massive blanks here, but I would say there's a really good chance that Brett had already decided that Austin was going to be his comeback opponent, whilst before he'd even been penciled in to win that tournament. Um, so, mate, for the, to create a dramatic and interesting podcast, really, I should be arguing with you here, but I fully agree with everything you say. I think, I think it was... Uh, there's obviously no question about where Austin went after the King of the Ring. There's no, you know, there's no question he was the biggest star. But obviously, you'd be foolish to argue otherwise, and you wouldn't. But did the King of the Ring do anything towards that? Something, not enough to make him a contender here. I'm having, I'm not having one of five either. Your, your, your point about him beating uh, Jake, who I should say, not only, not only can Jake make an appearance, but uh, so does uh, I don't know if that's Damien or Lucifer, but uh, we've got one of them there. Um, I the match against Jake means something. Uh, the fact that it was Jake—I mean, even it's a beaten down, <laughs> it's a beaten down Jake Roberts. You realise is you know wasn't even forty at the time. Um, no, oh God. But, um, but then that's another that's another matter. Well, I think he's around about forty actually. Uh, but all that's all that's you know effective. But it just it just didn't take him anywhere. When you compare who we've been to comparing to, this is more my point. Well, I'm happily do a head to head against five other people that we've already discussed and say, okay, did it do more for Owen than it did for Steve? I believe it did. Did it do more for Kurt? Did it do more for X, Y, Z? I believe it did more for other people. And in terms of the actual matches themselves, well, the match against um, 
uh, Jake in the final is like three minutes, isn't it? Because Austin's beaten up and Jake's old or beaten down. And Austin had been to the hospital, had he not, early on in the night because he'd cut himself open. Yeah. Um, was it, it was Mero, wasn't it? Was Mero was his semi-final, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, like yeah. Austin, Austin Mero is not a classic by any means. And then the final is just like a kind of Jake stumbles around stunner ending. Nothing. Nothing. It's all about the post-match promo. And to me, I can't put forward a promo that ended up having nothing doing for five months and a completely unmemorable semi-final and final. Apart from knowing who the opponent was that he beat because it was important that it was Jake Roberts. We're going to get slaughtered for this, mate, but we're not having him on the five. Well, last week, last week with the position we were in, what's Undertaker's greatest match outside of WrestleMania? And we did not include the match against Mankind. Uh, at, at, um, and that was a King of Ring, wasn't it? But um, just the yeah. way it goes. No, we didn't include that match because it's not a match. It's a big stunt show. It's memorable, but it's not a match. It doesn't fit in with what we were doing. And what I said at the time was, okay, if you can come up with, if you can't, if we can't come up with five better, then it can go in. But we did come up with five better. And I would say we can come up with five better than Austin. That's the way I, I would kind of frame this. Uh, and it's really now a case of just us framing our final five because I think we've done the topic to death. I think we've gone through everything we need to do. It's now a case of making sure of the five. So I think there are at least two or three which we are unmoved about. I'm going to do these more or less in chronological order now. Um, for the for the matches themselves, for it being the first one, for the performance, I think Brett has to be in the five. Yep. I think for what he did with winning it, what he did in the whole of the year following and using the gimmick, I think Owen has to be in it. Yep. I think because it's so memorable with everything he did with the gimmick projecting and it being the best part of his career, I think King Booker has to be in it. Yep. I think that's the th the only three that I think are unmovable. Uh, I probably would put next Kurt as Agreed. my fourth one because of what he did in that calendar year and so on. I am now at the point where I would have a couple ahead of Austin. But since we are a demo, we are a bit of a democracy. And if you think that people may vote for Steve, because this at the end of the day is a people's vote. Are we denying people a vote? Mm. I wonder if we've put enough of a, a, a you know, a, we've put enough of a case for the other four that they might win ahead of it. I personally think I would go for Regal next. Okay. Um, there is a case for going back to Savage, as we start. We talked about at the start of the podcast. Um, we talked about what it did for Edge. You know, there's a few, and you you put your case for Corbin. Um, you know, there's a few that we can we can discuss. I would reluctantly allow Steve Austin to go in at the fifth position, based off of the fact that I think that the other four, if he did it at the expense of the four that I've mentioned, if he was at the expense of Brett Owen Kurt or Booker, I think that would be egregious. But I think if it was at the expense of anyone else, I would be willing to understand why the night that Stone Cold Steve Austin said the biggest catchphrase in pro wrestling history got him into the five. Well, I don't disagree with that. I don't feel so strongly about any of the other contenders that we can't leave. Like you said, there's been a lot of mention of him. Um, let's put him on there. And let's see if we've done enough to uh, to dissuade. You know? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly it. I think anyone voting. So um, I believe that uh, in a second we'll just tell we'll tell you how to vote. I'm sure Paul will uh, stick it on the little crawler on the bottom for those of you that are watching. Uh, thank you, by the way, if you have joined us live tonight. I know we haven't discussed loads and loads that have been going on in the room and in the chat and whatever. For those of you listening to the podcast, um, we have been putting some comments up on the screen as as we go along. Um, but if we'd have been spending all night talking to the chat, then it's a bit wrong on the uh, the podcast listeners. Um, we'll come back to the, the the nature of how we're delivering the podcast in in just a second. Um, but yeah, so if anyone voting, you know, I would say that our pitch to you is that we probably wouldn't vote for Steve Austin. That wouldn't be our thing. But it's probably a little bit. Un I can't really deep down put a big enough case for Edge or for Lesnar or for Regal or for Savage or anyone else ahead of Stone Cold the way that I could last week for uh, Taker versus uh, Rock versus Angle or Taker versus Jeff Hardy or, or whatever it was. 
Um, so if you're happy with that, because if you're not, we can we can discuss it. But nope. if you're happy with that, that's no, all no. fine. I think that's fair. I think that works, and I think it's a solid, strong, uh, and varied five. So Stone Cold Steve Austin, Bret the Hitman Hart, Owen Hart, Kurt Angle, and King Booker are our five. So it's not a bad five. Well, I'm not sure about this one. See, I think we've had a couple of weeks where uh, it's kind of I, was, I, I loved talking about Undertaker last week, and I loved coming up with the top five. I pretty much knew that the match with Sean would win. You know, I, I yeah. think I knew what the winner was going to be. We've had a couple of podcasts where I think we knew what the winner was going to be. I'm not sure here, you know. I would. What would you um, vote for? What would you vote? I know who I would vote for. Who would you vote um, for? Owen or yeah, Booker? I think no, I'd say Owen. And I'm an mm. enormous Bret Hart fan. Anyone knows that? Anyone's listened to this? And I think I'd probably go for Bret next because of that, you know, um, feeling. But I think Owen, in terms of the whole thing, I'm saying the night itself, the story, the matches, and the character. I think Owens is the only one that ticks two boxes. Brett's is the night. Booker is the character. Kurtz is a bit of both. Um, and obviously Austin we've just discussed. But I think Owen is the only one where you go, it's a great um, run to the final, it's a great story to the final, and the character takes off. So yeah. I'd, I'd be yeah. an Owen Hart vote. Um, but it's not just up to us. Um, any of you can now go and vote. Actually, not immediately. We'll have to set the page up. No. Um, so I've put on the crawl. The vote will open when we put this on Spotify, which will be on Wednesday at some yeah. point. So we'll uh, we'll keep you guys informed. We'll stick it on the Hooked on Wrestling Facebook page. But when it is time to vote, you can vote at hookedonwrestling.co.uk forward slash vote. Okay. So anyone, anyone, I think I got the, I think I got the address wrong last week. So yes, hookedonwrestling.co.uk forward slash vote uh, is where to go and do it. If you're listening to the podcast, it will almost certainly be live as you're listening. For those of you that are watching us live or you're watching this uh, Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning uh, via Facebook Live or YouTube Live, uh, it will be a little bit into Wednesday. But we will let everybody know. It will be announced. It will be out there. If not, just keep on checking back. Uh, through uh, the days to find the vote and we will be interested to see which way you vote. We will find out the winner uh, on next week's podcast and in a minute uh, I'm going to let you know uh, if I know I'm not we're going to we've, we've, we've got something up our sleeve in terms of next week's podcast so that'll be it'll be announced a little bit later in the week uh, in terms of next week's one uh, but uh, I'm sure Paul will happily fill you in on a few things that are going on in Hooked on Wrestling's world at the moment. This is, we've left plugging until quite late in the show this week. So, uh, we're going to go, we're gonna go keep Mr. It, B. We'll keep it very quick. But essentially, this week, what I want to talk to you guys about is firstly, on Sunday night is our live quiz. Every Sunday night at 8 p.m. on Facebook Live and on YouTube, me, Rob, and Hatchamania, our third man, our Hulk Hogan to our Hall and Nash. We put on this live Facebook quiz. It's about an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, it's getting such a following now. It's really growing legs. Um, it's a bit of quizzing of a decent standard, but more fun, interactive, chatting away, silliness. I can't really describe it. Just check it out. Just come to Facebook, our Facebook page at eight o'clock every Sunday night and we're there. It's on Facebook Live. Just yeah, just just sat there on the feed. Can't really miss it. Um, to us, that's, our, that's the Hooked on Wrestling highlight of the week at the moment. Um, <laughs> And it's archived. Also, well. It's archived, so you can go back yeah. and watch the ones that have been. So if you're not quite sure what it's about, you can go back and uh, watch previous ones. And it's been in quite encouraging, yeah. actually. We've seen people join us live and say, I'm, I'm joining in live this week because I've seen the old ones on the website and they're quite exactly. it, which is really it's, heartening to see. And to challenge Paul's point, Chris Hatch is not our Hulk Hogan to our Hall and Nash. He has to be our Paul Bearer to our Undertaker and Kane. <laughs> if you do nothing else... And if you haven't seen this week's quiz, go and skim through a little bit. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Paul made Chris. Chris acts as our referee. Uh, he's a, he is a proper referee and uh, ring announcer in British wrestling. Um, he acts as our referee on uh, quiz nights. And Paul challenged him a couple of weeks ago to read uh, the results or read them the bonus points that he gives out uh, in the style of James Alexander Gordon, who used to do the classified results on, on BBC Radio 5 Live. This week, I challenged Chris to do it. And I didn't warn him. I gave him, like, no notice and said I wanted him to read them out as, as Paul Bearer since we were doing an Undertaker quiz. His Paul Bearer needs to be seen to be believed. I am not going to tell you any more details. Go and watch it. 
I am very rarely speechless, and I had gone. I folded up, was just back in my seat laughing. We struggled to carry on. If about five minutes later, I was still chuckling. Chris is a, is a legend and a genius, and we, it was the best thing that happened on Sunday. But those things are happening every week now it, because it's spontaneous, and it's fun, and it's different. As I often say, it's about 10 minutes entertainment stretched over an hour and three-quarter period, but we have the greatest fun doing it, and it's great that it's growing. So, yeah, if you do nothing so else check, with us this week, join us for the quiz on Sunday. Check that out. And also, the last thing I'll say is check out the website if you haven't already, hookedonwrestling.co.uk. Uh, it's, just, it's just really interesting it's a treasure trove of wrestling content that's what it is there's news there's features it's a little bit different it's not you run in a mill she said he said on twitter it's fun it's uh, informative it's varied we've got quizzes on there as we already talked about we've got you know the reviews on a slightly different style we've got a whole podcast network on there with five different shows i want you to check out just go in get on the website and have a play have a dive through some of the old stuff tell us what you think um we want it to be part of your daily wrestling habit. We want you to get on there in the morning and see what's going on overnight. We want you to get on there lunchtime, evening, just use us. You know, we want to make sure that we're still with you um, throughout the year, whether we do parties or not. And on that note, we also write pinned to the top of the Facebook page as we record this on the 23rd of June, for the next few days there will be a survey um, about mm -hmm future parties about specifically about whether you want us to start our events again for SummerSlam. Um please if you've got two minutes and that's literally what it takes it's four tick box questions please fill it out um let us know your opinion especially if you've been to our events before um we really want to know whether there's an appetite to do SummerSlam or whether we just need to hold off a little bit more so it's in your hands um i'll leave it there rob i think that's a night mate it is, and a, great, and a really fun night. Um, this has been uh, our first live podcast uh, effort. Uh, we may consider this doing this again. Whether it will be a weekly thing or not is... Uh, I don't know. I'd, I think we'd quite like to do it, but sometimes our commitments Let's and see. other things going on make it a little bit tricky. So we're not committing right now to doing this at a certain time every week, but do stay tuned, um, because if we can do it this way, then why wouldn't we? Because it means you can join in live, yeah. Uh, it doesn't affect the way that we do the recording and all that kind of thing. So we would endeavour to do this uh, if we can in the future. The best thing to do is to make sure, I'm sure most of you are already, but the best thing to do is make sure you're following us on all social medias, just in case we left, leave one off, just in case we favour one ahead of the other. So Paul is now going to tell you how to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Here we go. So Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, we're all the same. It's this the website forward slash hooked on wrestling so facebook instagram youtube hook, forward slash hooked on wrestling then we've got twitter which is at ho underscore wrestling lord i wish i made it consistent when i started this up it'd be so much easier wouldn't it um but there there are there are handles that's where you'll find us uh just talk to us you know we're always around we're always up to engage so just you know just reach out and say hi talk wrestling talk nonsense talk football matt barber um <laughs> if you like but uh but just just say say hi That's... uh as paul said make sure you check out the website because there's all sorts of different stuff on there we're trying to make it different it's not a dirt sheet it's not a rumors site um but there's a bit of news and there's a bit of chat and there's some opinions and there's some old stuff some retro stuff and some stuff you wouldn't really uh, believe that you'd get on a wrestling site but that's that's what we're about it's all a bit different uh, and for a bit of fun if you're a podcast listener uh, a reminder you can now see this as a video thing uh, the best place to do that is via YouTube, youtube.com forward slash hooked on wrestling. And please, anybody, give us a little subscribe on the YouTube. Uh, even if you dismiss them a little bit, it really does help us. The more subscribers we have, particularly yeah. YouTube, subscribe everywhere if you can, but particularly YouTube, because the more subscribers we have, the more we can uh, monetize our content, which makes sure we can do more things. It just leads to some nice things. So one little click on from you. Um, can help us uh, a great deal and uh, a little bit of a milestone do you want to tell everyone just before we go about our milestone day today on uh, social media yeah all right i will you're the only person i told about but for, for, for after seven years a nice slow but strong organic growth we hit ten thousand followers on facebook today how cool is that i think that's pretty good you know i mean i don't think that's a something to be sniffed at ten thousand is a lot of people when you build up things for you know Hooked on Wrestling has gone through a lot of guises. It's been uh, an online magazine. It's been a uh, 
live parties. It's been different podcasts. It's been various different incarnations. It's been a live touring thing. It's been all sorts of things. But we've settled into a website, a podcast network, and once life gets back to normal again, our pay-per-view parties. But it's nice to be diversifying. But all the way along, we've been building slowly and people have been with us. And for those of us that were there from the start, which is basically just me and Paul, um, you know, this started with some blokes watching a wrestling show on a sofa in Camden. And seven or eight years later has 10,000 followers. So permit us to have just a little uh, moment of uh, self-congratulatory grinning, beaming here on the show. And I'll say yeah. to you, Paul, well done in particular, because it's quite frankly, you're the driving force behind this. I just, I just piss around on a quiz and a podcast and occasionally write an article saying how wow. good Jericho and John Michaels are. You're the one that does all the work. Um, so, but thank you everybody for, for supporting us, for, for um, going along with us all the way through this, uh, this ride. And as Paul says, please do the survey because it will, um, little bits of um, what seems little to you, customer background, can really, really help us just gain a bit of an idea. So I know we're doing a bit of pleading towards yep. the end of the podcast here, but uh, uh, it does mean a lot to us. But more than anything else, it means a lot that you're here, you've listened, you've watched. And uh, I'll leave you uh, to give one or two other mentions, Paul, if, if anything, and then I'll wrap up. No, I think we're all good, mate. I think we can we can get off here, say goodnight to everyone, or goodbye, depending on what time you listen to us, and I'll go and see my missus. <laughs> Keep on following us on social media. Don't forget the quiz on Sunday night at 8pm, and we will let you know the topic of next week's podcast in the upcoming days, and you can get involved with your comments that way as well. Thank you so much for listening, watching, however you've communicated this week. We'll see you very soon on the How To Be Great podcast but from showbiz Paul Benson and from myself, Rob McNichol. Don't forget, it's wrestling. Enjoy it. We'll see you very soon. Night all.